Hi, my name is Steelfur of Steelfur Speaks. I primarily make videos about trading card games and flesh and blood, but I've recently started getting into a new hobby that is Warhammer um, painting. I don't know why, as a 34 year old with dyspraxia, I decided to get into Warhammer painting. I think I was in search of a non digital hobby that I could just sit and do that wasn't like reading um, and kind of like tested my motor skills and kind of kept them sharp. Uh, I've always kind of looked for things, whether it's playing the guitar or something like that, that would keep me motion like challenged. Um, and I thought I would, because I'm a content creator, do a video that sort of documented the start of this journey, uh, where I am and what I have initially kind of discovered that might help other people who are also beginners with dyspraxia thinking about getting into Warhammer. Maybe you want to play the game and you've always seen it and it's great. Um, so firstly, I mean, if you have dyspraxia, if you don't, you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Developmental coordination disorder, aka dyspraxia, um, is kind of like dyslexia for the for motor activities. Like you're not as good at gross motor skills, fine motor skills, coordination. It doesn't just affect like how clumsy you are. It also affects like cognition about things. So things that seem obvious to people, like how to move your hand to catch a ball or something like that, might be something that you have to think about. Um, you know, you might have a question that everyone else thinks is, you know, completely obvious about how you move your hand to achieve a certain activity, that kind of thing. Um, in my life, it's affected me pretty simply in that I can't write very well. Um, it took me ages to learn how to tie my shoes. And I tend to go towards gross physical activity sports like rowing, running, cycling, um, as versus like fine sports. Um, and also rather funnily, I often have food stains on my clothes because... I drop food on myself, I would say, on average, more than the typical person. It doesn't happen every day. I'm not that gross. But, you know, I would say on average more than the average person. So uh, there you go. But Warhammer, obviously, is a game that re it requires a certain amount of physical coordination to paint. Uh, and painting Warhammer is something that I've decided I wanted to do as a bit of a challenge to myself and something that I've always wanted to do. Now, whether I end up playing the game or not, that will be. So where am I? I have bought the Skaven Tide box. Uh, this is the latest starter set from Games Workshop. It comes with two armies, the Skaven and the Stormcast Eternals. I have always loved Skaven. Um, I've played them in Total Warhammer 2. Um, I just love the vibe of them. I played them in more, more time years ago, and I just thought Skaven, great, fantastic. Was that a good decision? We'll get back to that later. Um, and where am I then when it comes to my Skaven? So let me just show you some photos. Um, I'm currently at kind of like stage three or four. So I've painted the... Um, you know, I've primed them, I've painted the metal, I've washed the metal, I'm now doing all the skin. And that's where I've gotten to, so I'm not super advanced yet. I haven't done a lot of details. You see, I'm just painting the skin. I'm on kind of layer one slash one and a half of the skin. Um, it's taken more on some others as I've been getting kind of like the... Um, the... Uh, the uh, density of the paint right. Um... But I've also had quite a decent amount of help doing this. So my first tip and piece of advice, right, which should be fairly obvious, but let's just get this out there. You need a friend, okay? You need a friend for many things, but the first thing you need to do before Bailey Warhammer, and whether this is like a weekly night um, or whether this is a friend, you know, from a Discord or someone who gets you into the hobby, um... If you're painting Warhammer with dyspraxia, you need a friend. And and more so than other... I believe if you have very good hands and good eyes and you're good at painting, you could probably just follow a guide on YouTube and you'd be fine. But I think specifically when you have this thing that we have, uh, you really do need a friend because there is a level of questions that I think, you know, other people wouldn't think to ask and YouTube videos won't think to explain which you will have, right? To the extent of, I said to a friend, look, I need you to show me on video, am I holding my hand like this or like this or exactly what am I doing? And that's kind of the level of question that sometimes you have to ask. Asking someone who's your friend helps so much easier because you don't feel a silly asking those questions. You have to ask them to a stranger. You'd have spent ages Googling. You can just send a quick message and say, hey, how do I do X? Or even better, if you're at like a weekly or monthly painting night or something like that, you can, you know, ask them there and get help from whoever's helping people learn how to paint. So I very much would say get a friend or even attend a painting session regularly 
for example. Um, okay, that's first piece of advice. That advice also lets me give you the second piece of advice, which is cheat liberally. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean, <laughs> there are loads of guides on how to do things easily, simply, and with as minimal hassle as possible. As someone with dyspraxia, you should use all of them wherever possible. And, like, there is advice, like, if things like contrast paints, which, for example, um, if you're new to Warhammer, there are these new paint ranges from a couple of years ago called contrast paints. Basically, they have shader built in that's designed to pool in the details. So you can just paint a layer of contrast over miniatures, right? And by doing that, like, you can save a lot of time and also save a lot of detailing that you might have to do. And you're not going to get as good a finish as you could get if you do it properly, you know, as painters will do with, like, highlights and lots of detail. But, you know, you'll get there. And, and that's something. There's contrast paints. There's, like, quick tips. Any sort of advice you can get, just cheat liberally. And also, third important piece of cheating, <laughs> ask for help with hard parts um so <laughs> i have already encountered one or two pieces on my models that i already know i'm going to ask my partner for help with because I, there's one or two places where the skin and the metal bits that i've done get way too close together and i have already had to touch up the metal and touch up the skin and to basically do it a few times so i'm just gonna ask for someone to help me do those bits and the same i already know the same is gonna go for eyeballs and eyes and you know the rivets on this gun if i can't do it I, I can just ask someone for help and again it comes back to having a friend but it's not cheating to ask someone to help you with the little little bits that you find difficult right that's fine so when i say cheat liberally i'm not talking about competitive play i'm just like if there is a way for you to do things easier look it up ask for advice learn how to do it and you know stuff helps like my friend was like one of the things i struggled with was i was keep messing up the details and he was like you keep position you like this is something no video explained which was you he said you just keep painting from a position of weakness and what he meant by that was that if you cup your hands or you're touching your hands in some way so either you're holding the miniature like this and you're holding the paintbrush like this then you have power you're stable or if you're touching your fingers in some way and you're doing this. But by touching your two hands together, you create a position of power. That is a cheat in my mind. Um, or it's good technique that someone will teach you if you go to a painting session. Um, but all those sorts of things, you need to learn these because they will make them easier for you. And again, it kind of ties back to the idea of having a friend going to a painting session where you can ask for those kind of tips. But you aren't one of those people who, starting off, can aim for perfection and to do things the hardest way possible right and i think it's important to accept that and this come kind of comes down to point three which is decide what is good enough okay so for me good enough is painted all the colors done and on the table right good enough for me is painted and finished right it's not necessarily all the highlighting done and all the best edges done and all the best colors i will consider this project a success if in you know two three months time i have painted the entire skaven side of my box and that each model has each area mostly colored in the way that it's supposed to be colored right and that to me it would be a win that i would consider that a success and i would be happy with that right so consider for you what is a success and and aim for that right don't aim for the moon um because like <laughs> i'm not here to be negative but like many people with dyspraxia you can't do things as well as other people you might get there eventually but start off with a conversation with yourself about where you're going to be happy and that will set yourself with a positive outlook of i didn't get to do x but at least i got to do y right so you get into this position where okay you, you didn't get it perfect but okay it, it's good enough okay so just keep that in mind i would have a conversation with yourself and that will help you from getting you know disheartened when things go wrong because ultimately things are going to go wrong now i have already as you can see from these you can see there's some flesh on that sword that I did before. 
you can see that there's some flesh on that metal I did before. I'm going to have to retouch all of these things. And I would say, on average, I'm probably going to have to retouch things more than the typical person who's painting. I have accepted that, and I'm okay with it, as long as we end up with the result. The amount that I have to fix is always going to be less than the amount I had to do to begin with. And again, if there's something that I keep getting wrong over and over again, I am just going to ask for help. I'm not going to sit there, you know, head in hand being like, oh no, I can't do this. I have to do everything myself. I'm going to accept that things are going to go wrong. I'm going to ask for help when I need it and try and get to a place where I have done, say, 90% of the work on these models, assembling them, all these kind of things. And if someone else does the 10%, I, I don't mind. Okay. Um, so that's that's good. And I think along with this as well, I think consider the tools that will set you up for success. So things that I found very, very useful. I found a miniature painting handle. Very useful. Just gives me something bigger to grip on. More distance from the model. Um, I found I have a specific, I have a very bright lamp, desk lamp, uh, for painting that's helped out tons. And the other thing I think now a lot of people, and I really don't, I'm not one of those people who recommends if you're going out to buy a hobby, buying all of the expensive stuff at the start, but I have actually found a wet palette super useful. And there's two main reasons for that, specifically dyspraxic reasons. The first reason is I like to take more breaks so that my brain stays fresh, so I'm less likely to be clumsy. Um, I'm sure others, you know, with my condition have felt similar. Um, and for that, having a wet palette so the paint doesn't dry out while I'm going to walk the dog or make some tea is a really good idea. Um, if you are wondering what wet palettes are, they're basically a wet palette. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, they're basically, it's water which you lay the paint on top so it keeps the paint from drying out for longer. That's all it is. You can make them. There are loads of tutorials on how to make them with like um, kitchen t towels and um, parchment paper. You know, you don't need to spend a lot of money on them. But I wouldn't. I would look into them and, and look into how to use them, um, because they let me take breaks without worrying about my paint drying and having to remix it. Um, they let me keep the paint that I was using in the previous session fresh for longer, which means I can come back to fix bits that will go wrong, and they will go wrong. So I found wet palettes actually to be super useful so far, even for the bits that I've done, just for keeping the paints that I'm using fresh for longer so I can come back and fix mistakes. Um, but that's like a that's like an edge goal. Um, so these are all to do with painting, right? So you're sitting there, you're painting, you've got your friends, you're asking for help, who will answer your weird questions about hand movements and how you look at stuff and how to optimize specific things. Um, you've got all your cheats, your top tips, your videos and all those kind of things. You've asked for help with some hard parts. Things are going very well. You've accepted that things aren't going to be perfect, right? And you're set up so that when things go wrong, you're not letting that dishearten you from continuing with the hobby. You know that you're going to get there eventually. You're going to fix things that go wrong wherever you are. And you've got yourself one or two things that are going to help you. Let's talk about actual like non, like non painting things, right? So you're doing all of this. You're having all this help, right? Um, and the other thing I think, well, before we move on, just one more thing, which is like when you're deciding what is good enough, like do decide how much you're going to like try and learn to highlight. I have been practicing highlighting. It is possible. It is a bit more difficult for me um, than from what I've you know seen. Um, but also just like don't beat yourself up about a lot of this stuff because, and I think this is actually worth a separate point, is be kind to yourself. Um, I think it's really easy when you have dyspraxia to assume you're miles worse than everyone else. But having had a lot of conversations with people who do hobbies in the space, a lot of people who start off painting are bad at painting. So it isn't just you. You might be a bit worse, but you're not like you're not going to be the worst person ever. Um, so let's move away from painting now and just into the hobby in general. Um, <laughs> and and also, I mean, so army choice is big. Right. I think army choice is huge. Right. So I said I have bought the Skaven Tide box because I really love Skaven and I want to paint Skaven. Now, you'll notice something. So this is the Skaven side on the right and this is the Stormcast Eternal side on the left. And you will notice pretty quickly the Skaven has a lot more miniatures than the right hand side and then the left hand side of the board. If I was painting Stormcast Eternals, I would be painting 6, 12, maybe 20 miniatures. 
there are 40 clan rats alone in this box. And, like, clan rats, by their nature, are small. There aren't that many of them. And, you know, you kind of have a lot of them going on, right? So... Oh, I had this open a second ago. These are the clan rats. You'll see they're painted kind of badly. Um, and I think... I think it's worth me saying that, you know, you are probably better off picking a more elite army. So in Warhammer, both Age of Sigmar and 40k, you have elite and horde armies. Horde armies are, we have tons of miniatures. Elite armies are, we use fewer miniatures, um, but the miniatures are more powerful. So I think, I think saying choose an elite army... Or be very, very patient <laughs> is a really good piece of advice. Um, so if I was doing this again, I probably would not be starting with Skaven. I probably would be starting with Stormcaster Turtles. Or if I was doing Warhammer, I'd be starting with either Adeptus Custodes or Grey Knights. Um, so what's interesting, so a lot of people purport like the rule of cool when it comes to getting into painting and when it comes to getting into Warhammer. That means that you should pick the army you think looks the coolest, not the army that is the best, because, um, you know, ultimately whether or not an army is good or bad is going to depend on balance, but you're always going to have to deal with the aesthetic. I agree with that completely. But I do think that specifically for us Dyspraxics, considering how many models are in the army and how big they are is actually a very big consideration. Now, I have heard that in Age of Sigma, um, most armies have kind of an elite option. So that means that, like, you could build any faction and just fill your army with elites. But, you know, it is worth, I guess, considering what is a good and a bad army, um, especially if you are, like... Um, you know, if you're looking at competitive play, um, you know, you should see what models are being used. And that should impact your decision a little bit. Because assuming you want to get into playing Warhammer, um, that should impact your decision a little bit. So, I mean, if you're seeing that you really like Tyranids, but it's a Horde army, and but people are saying, okay, but, you know, the models that everyone's playing are these big... Um, lectors lictors whatever they're called carnifexes and stuff um then maybe you want to do that and you're just going to paint those big miniatures but i think based on my experience so far with skaven um while there are a lot of miniatures just the size is is challenging the size is challenging getting the details right on a hand that's you know only 0.5 centimeters wide if that you know is difficult whereas if we were to look at say you know um, if we were to look at, say, uh, da, 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 da. you know, if we were to look at Imperial Knights, right, for example, Imperial Knights are the elite of the elite armies. You typically only field, I think, 10 or 5 miniatures. They are this big. <laughs> and they are this big, and you put them on the tabletop, and they do their thing. Now, there's a lot of discussion about whether they're good or fun or, or they're the army that you should play. Um, but there is a huge difference, say, in 40k between playing an elite army like Knights or an elite army like, say, the Adeptus Custodes, who only field 20 miniatures, and playing someone like our Skaven or our Tyranids, who might field upwards of 160. Um, so that is just worth keeping in mind, right? I mean, it, it is worth just keeping an idea of how many models are in the army that you want to paint. And I'm not saying that if your heart is really set on it, you shouldn't paint a horde army. I'm painting Skaven. But I think elite armies with bigger models are probably the best way to go. Set yourself up for success. Um, the other thing, of course... Now, I have heard mixed reports on this. Um, what can I do without painting? This is a really big question right? I've heard mixed reports of this. So apparently if you're playing week to week, most game stores don't care if your stuff is painted unless you're playing specifically in games workshop stores because they want you to have painted armies to show off how good they look and stuff like that. However, on the tournament scene, apparently painting is much more of a requirement. Now I haven't gotten into this side, but I know a lot of people in the hobby. Apparently having a painted army to play in a tournament is kind of the, the norm. I will say this, though. 
if you have dyspraxia and you're struggling with painting and only half of your army is painted, I would walk into a game store, even if there's a tournament on, and just say, look, I have dyspraxia. Prove it if you want to. If not, just have a conversation with the person running the tournament and say, look, I want to paint my miniatures. I haven't got there yet. Can I play in the tournament anyway? And I, I genuinely think you will be able to have, except maybe at the highest levels or where Games Workshop is involved, you will be able to have a positive dialogue about your condition where they will see, look, you're trying, but it's taking a long time, but you want to play in the tournament. And they will probably let you and explain to everyone what's going on and basically give you a format. We are ultimately here to play games. Um, I would be very surprised if after a fruitful discussion like that, you can't just play with what you've got. Um, if they even stop you in the first place. So don't be put off by the fact that you have all of these unpainted miniatures and it's taking you ages to get them done. Firstly, that's something that apparently everyone struggles with, aka my friends who message me being like, I have 5,000 points of unpainted Skaven in my in my bedroom. And I'm like, okay, cool. What did you just buy last week? Oh, you bought more models. Okay, good. Congratulations. Um, so apparently everyone struggles with this. Um, but also, like, just have conversations, right? You know, have conversations speak to tournament organizers um don't be afraid you know to articulate your condition and what you need right because there is a difference i think it's important as something i found playing tcgs and, and playing lots of other games there is a difference between someone who is lazy and someone who is struggling right someone who is lazy and can paint very very well but hasn't got around to painting their army yet kind of needs a nudge from the tournament organizers to be like get your paints together finish your army because it looks terrible someone who has a disability and is struggling to get their army painted quickly you know needs that breathing room and that's different it's fine to ask for it in any of these contexts it's always fine to ask for it so you're in now a situation you've chosen your elite army or one that's moderately elite um you're kind of in a position where you've got the models that you want you're thinking don't rush out and buy loads of models, right? It's very likely that you could run out of energy in this hobby, right? Take it slow. And decide, this is kind of tying back to deciding what your end goal is going to be, right? If your end goal is to play Warhammer 40,000 or Warhammer Age of Sigmar as soon as possible and have fun playing that hobby, then you should talk to people at your local game store, put together an army sheet, Maybe play Spearhead, which has just come out, which is really cool, or Combat Patrol, those two new game modes. And don't worry about all of the painting and everything straight away, right? And I know for a fact that Spearhead doesn't require painting for you to play locally, and I'm sure loads of people won't. Um, but you're kind of there, build your army, get your models together. One option that you can consider, and this is something I am not considering because I'm I'm in no rush because I'm not a competitive player, but if I was in a mind to get in competitively, I would consider can't someone else paint it? I would consider that. So if I'm I have my army, right? Elite army, somewhere in between, um, you know, I've decided what my other well, actually, sorry, here's one more point before we go there. Army choice. Just remember that people don't care as much about the small miniatures. Sorry, I think that's just a valid point to make before we move on, which is that I have all my clan rats, right? I have 40 of them. People are not going to be picking up each of my clan rats. Well, they might, but they're not going to be picking up each of my clan rats because I'll probably have 80 in my army and paying scrutiny to every single detail on those models. It is okay to paint the horde or however many of your small models in less detail and to care less about them. My big models, my rat ogres and my rattling cannons and my warp cannons and all these kind of things... I probably should spend a bit longer painting. I should probably make it look better. But I think it's important to just understand that even if you don't, like, you have your heart set on playing a non-elite army that's kind of, like, somewhere in the middle, or you want to play Tyranids and they're a horde army, that's okay. Like, it is okay to just accept that your smaller miniatures, the less important ones, are just going to have a load of mistakes on, and people aren't going to call you out on it. And if they do, just shrug and be like, okay, but whatever. Like, you know that's fine. The other thing I think I would consider, and I think it's just worth thinking about, is can't someone else paint it? 
So if you've got a model that you really, really care about and it's the centerpiece of your entire army, you know, save up, pay a professional painter. You go onto Fiverr, there are loads of people who paint Warhammer for money and for fun. Not for fun, for money. They all paint them for money. And they charge different amounts based on the size of the model, the amount of them they have to paint, etc., etc. You can save up and you can take your centerpiece thing or even that horde, right? You want to play Tyranids, you have a horde of minis and you're really struggling with them because they're too small. Gather all those up, find someone who gives you a good rate. They usually don't paint the hordes as well. Um, but they also, you know, don't charge as much for them and just get someone else to paint them for you. And if you think, if you're playing every week with this army and you're really enjoying yourself, you can set aside a bit of money every month and eventually you'll have saved up a bit, a decent chunk, get someone else to paint those models for you, right? So for me, that's not really an option because I'm not rushing to pay competitively. But again, if I was and I was missing a painted piece of my army, I would pay someone to do it. I would if it, it or or for example if I find a model that is like so key to my army so say if I was playing custodies and I had this big dreadnought sitting at the back or if I build a grey knight's army and I have a dreadwalker and I have loads of small space marines and stuff that I have painted and they're fine uh, but at the back of the army I just have this giant dreadwalker who is every every single time I play anyone eyes are going to be on that and it's going to be really good and I have struggled with the details and I've looked at it once or twice and I'm really finding it difficult why would I not just be like let's save up and let's pay someone to paint this right I'm not saying you should I'm not saying you have to but I'm saying like if it will bring you joy to own the painted thing you are not losing anything by just saying hey someone else can do this for me right also like Ask people to paint stuff for you. Like, provide the paints, provide the time, provide some other form of incentive, like food or other favors, like not anything dodgy, but, you know, something else that you can do for them, whether it's in a different hobby or buying them one of their favorite miniatures or something like that, or, you know, helping them with a chore or something. But, you know, Ask someone else to paint something that you're struggling with for you. Not just like eyeballs or something specific like that. But, you know, if you have a centerpiece mini and, you know, your friend just finished something in a really good color, have a chat with them and say, hey, can you do a bit of that for me? Right. And obviously, if you're constantly take, 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 you're going to find that's difficult. But if you're engaged and you're being friendly and you do things and you give and take, you might be surprised like what someone will do for you. Um, and, you know, especially if they know that it's something that you struggle with, right? So, you know, for me, a good example of this might be if I paint the entirety of my Grey Knights that I'm looking into, except the books or the banners, because I find those really difficult. I might do 90% of the banners. I'll do the big red and the big white and a bit of the texturing. And then I'll just go to one of my friends and say, hey, can you do like the scripters, the letters, the like just the final finishing touches and make it really easy for them. Get them whatever paints they want, whatever tools they want, get it set up. Right. And then they're going to they're going to do it. Right. It's not that difficult to be in a position where you're asking. So you can pay a professional painter. You can ask people to paint stuff for you. You know, you can get help. And the other thing I think, which I've been doing a bit, is what can I buy on eBay? Um, there are lots of people who sell armies. There are lots of people who sell painted armies. And they're not selling them like a, I'm a professional, I painted this army. Um, therefore, you have to pay me a professional wage for painting the army. They're selling the army to change it into something else. Now, painted armies are, of course, more expensive than unpainted armies. But if you really want a specific model and you want it painted to use, there might be a painted version of it on eBay for a decent price. It's worth looking at those. It's worth looking at other secondhand sources. Oh, sorry, that's the dog. Um, other secondhand sources that come painted, right? And having that advantage for you, right? So you don't have to just do things one way or another. You can look at all of these methods that are going to deliver what you need to a certain thing 
so just consider all of those options, right? And finally, if you, you know, do reach your wit's end, these things do contain value. You can sell semi-painted armies for a decent chunk of what they're worth. You can sell badly painted armies for a decent chunk of their worth. And if you do end up with a full army and you like it and or you don't like it anymore and you think, hey, can I turn this into a different army? A lot of the times there is still enough value in one army to trade, change it to another one. And I've heard a load of trading and things like that going on where people can swap their armies um, from one into another and perfectly happily, you know, trade what they've got for something else or sell what they've got and buy something else. So, you know, you have that secondhand market to trade what you've got for painted stuff. So just consider that, right? There are lots of different ways to approach this, um, some of which are just like full-on shortcuts where you're like just, hey, can't we just eBay and buy what we want? But others, I think, are quite specific to people with dyspraxia. Like, I think thinking about what army you're doing and choosing one that's a bit more elite. I don't think it has to be fully elite, but the difference between painting 30, 40 models versus painting 180 um, is quite big. And obviously, if those models are also bigger too, it becomes much easier to paint them. Um, you know, and have a look at what models are actually being used at the moment in those armies and, and how that ties into what you're actually going to have to paint to play with them. Don't be afraid to articulate your condition to other people in the hobby and ask them for help if that involves, you know, getting into a tournament with slightly unpainted minis or just doing some detailing work for you, that kind of thing. Like, it's okay to talk about. And, you know, just try and figure out the best way to approach this with your condition in mind. But don't get disheartened because ultimately I'm doing it. It is doable. Um, it's not going to be like perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It can just be okay. Um, and that is the motto of 2024 on my channel, by the way. It has been... So we started writing and everything like that is it's not perfect, but it is done. Um, and that is what we're going with. Um, so this is it. I'm going to do another one of these when I have finished my Warhammer painting journey. Um, and I'm a bit further along um, and see if any of these have changed or what we think about them. But let me know if you like this video. I'm not diving fully into Warhammer related content, um, but it's definitely a challenge and definitely interesting. Thank you very much and have a good time.